I find that Quakerism and research science fit together very, very well. In Quakerism, you're expected to develop your own understanding of God from your experience in the world. There isn't a creed, there isn't a dogma. Um, there's a, an understanding, but nothing as, as formal as a dogma or creed. And this idea that you develop your own understanding also means that you keep redeveloping your understanding as you get more experience. And it seems to me that's very like what goes on in the scientific method. You have a model of a star, it's an understanding, and you develop that model in the light of experiments and, and observations. And so in both, you're expected to evolve your thinking. Nothing is static, nothing is final. Everything is held provisionally. Through history, we've seen some theories that have stood the test of time well and some that have disappeared relatively quickly. Uh, a theory that stands the test of time well will have been prodded and poked and battered and examined from every angle, and it still stands up. And Einstein's theory of relativity is one of those that's been subject to a lot of scrutiny, but it was only following the discovery of pulsars that it was possible to test Einstein's ideas about gravity. Einstein's theories predict that where you have a pair of stars orbiting each other, this system produces a new kind of radiation, gravitational radiation or gravitational waves. And the effect of these waves being produced are that the two stars move closer together and go round faster which sends out more gravity waves, so they move closer together and go around even faster, and they actually end up merging. And with the first pulsar that was discovered in one of these binary systems, they've been able to track the orbit, and they have seen that the stars are moving closer together in exactly the manner predicted by Einstein in his theory. So does that mean that Einstein's been proved right then? The current situation is that um, the pulsar astronomers have shown that Einstein's theory of gravity is right to about 0.02%. That's not the same as saying it's true, though, is it? Scientists, will, scientists should never claim that something is absolutely true. You should never claim perfect or total or 100% because you never, ever get there. Is science therefore not a quest for the truth? Science is a quest for understanding. A search for truth seems to me to be full of pitfalls. We all have different understandings of what truth is. And we each believe, or we're in danger of each believing, that our truth is the one and only absolute truth, which is why I say it's full of pitfalls. Uh, I think a search for understanding is much more serviceable to humankind and is a sufficiently ambitious goal of itself. Jocelyn Bell Burnell has devoted her life to the search for understanding. After completing her PhD, she settled into the world of academia, continuing her research into the behavior of stars. I have very vivid memories of October the 10th, 1974. I was working with a satellite called Ariel 5 that was launching from off the coast of Kenya on the morning of the 10th of October. At about five past 12 that morning, one of my colleagues came steaming into the office. Have you heard the news? No, John, what news? Something wrong with Ariel 5? No, the Nobel Prize. His wife had been listening at home to the news and had phoned him up and told him that Martin Ryle and Tony Hewish had got the Nobel Prize. And uh, John was coming along, um, I think, hoping to see steam come out of my ears. Well, that was a, just a total huge surprise. Um, I mean, I just hadn't the faintest idea that it was going to happen like that. And to get it with... Martin Ryle was a double pleasure because, I mean, he was a wonderful man, 
And uh, the sadness was that uh, he wasn't able himself to go and, and collect the prize. Professor Anthony Jewish, the discovery of pulsars for which you played a decisive role is a most outstanding example of how, in recent years, our knowledge of the universe has been dramatically extended. It just is a wonderful experience. Other people were um, annoyed on my behalf, it has to be said. Um, and there were puns about no bell, punning on my, my maiden name, Bell, the no bell prize. I was slightly saddened that uh, Jocelyn Bell had not received an equal uh, uh, recognition of her contribution to that, which I think was absolutely central. And I, th I think it was, so there were many people who felt it was rather sad and that perhaps she should have been uh, up there with the others. Uh, and so there was, a, there was a fair amount of disappointment about that, I think, at the time. I mean, my analogy really is a little bit like um, um, when, you, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you plan a ship of discovery and you go off um, and, and somebody up the masthead says, land ho, um, that's great. But I mean, uh, who actually inspired it and, 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 and conceived it and decided what to do, when, and so on? I mean, there, there is a difference between skipper and crew. To be honest, I don't think it would have mattered who'd been my student. I mean, we, it was a serendipitous discovery because such a piece of equipment had been set up. I mean, the discovery of pulsars was unavoidable once that survey had begun. Well, serendipity is very important, but I think you shouldn't exaggerate how important it is. It would have been very easy for Jocelyn just to simply ignore that and put it in the not interesting brackets interference um, box, but she didn't do that. What Jocelyn had done was to recognize that there was something happening and happening in a repetitive manner. I suspect that perhaps only one in a hundred people, given the same circumstances, would have spotted it. It's not as though it's something that everybody would spot. She kept, I think, perhaps more meticulous records than probably her supervisor might have expected about what was going on. And I think that they provided the, the core evidence that really drove the whole discovery of pulsars. So, yes, she was lucky that she was there, but if she hadn't done it, it may have been many years, really, before anybody got around to looking at these things seriously. One of the questions it's always interesting to ask is, why weren't pulsars discovered earlier? And, in fact, they were seen earlier, but not recognised. And there are a number of stories around about people who saw pulsars but didn't realise what they were seeing and didn't follow it through. The earliest one I know comes from the late 50s, I believe, at an optical telescope which was open to the public. And the telescope was trained on that funny star in the middle of the Crab Nebula known as Minkowski's star. And a young woman stepped up to the telescope and said, that star's flashing. And Elliot Moore, the professional astronomer who was on duty that night, explained to this woman, you know, that stars scintillate, twinkle. And she said, I'm a pilot. I hold an airplane pilot's license. I know about scintillation, twinkling. That star's flashing. Now, the pulsar in the Crab Nebula, which is what Minkowski's star actually is, flashes 30 times a second which is very, very fast, and a lot of people can't see that. But actually, some people can. So I think she probably did see it, and I think Elliot Moore believes she saw it. But it wasn't followed through, it wasn't published, it wasn't recorded. So what's happening with the area now? The girl who started all the fuss about the pulsars, Jocelyn Bell. Our picture of how science is done has changed markedly. The picture used to be that there was a senior man, it always was a man, 
who had charge of a whole team of people. And the people in the team weren't expected to think. They just did what the boss told them. And if that's the true picture, then it's quite fair that the boss takes the blame or the credit. But these days we have a different picture. We have much more a picture of a team of people working together, uh, each contributing from their own strengths, each adding ideas, a uh, much more egalitarian picture. I think when I was a grad student, that was actually what was happening, but in an unrecognised way. We were still in the old um, 1920s, 1930s picture, although that wasn't really what was happening. It's almost like it was the intellectual property of the university and therefore it was the heads of department who were recognised for it. And she is remarkably calm and unbothered about it and um, doesn't make a fuss about it at all. You can actually do extremely well out of not getting a Nobel Prize. And I have had so many prizes and so many honours and so many awards that actually I think I've had far more fun than if I'd got a Nobel Prize, which is a bit flash in the pan. You get it, you have a fun week and it's all over. And nobody gives you anything else after that because they feel they can't match it. For Jocelyn Bell Burnell, the real enemy of science is not the allocation or otherwise of prizes, it is the belief that science can arrive at an ultimate truth. There are people around, I think, who believe they've got there, believe they understand it all, uh, and they're no longer open to new experiences, new ideas, new revelations. And I don't think you should be so closed. If we assume we've arrived, we stop searching. And we stop developing. Professor Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell has enjoyed a hugely successful career. She has gone from being the girl who discovered pulsars to international recognition as one of the outstanding scientists of our time. Though she has played a significant part in our greater understanding of the universe, she insists that there is still some way to go in telling the complete story of the cosmos. I can see a number of important issues facing astronomers today. There's questions about the future of the universe. We believe, we understand, that the universe started with what we call the Big Bang, 13, 14 billion years ago, and that it's been expanding ever since. One of the things we've recently discovered is that the expansion appears to be getting faster, which is totally counterintuitive. You would expect the gravity between the galaxies to actually be slowing the expansion, and it's not, it's getting faster. Something is acting to oppose gravity. Something is pushing the galaxies apart faster and faster. And at the moment, we have very little clue what that is. Uh, we call it dark energy, but that doesn't actually tell us what it is. It's just a label. It is hard to understand. I'm not sure how we're going to make progress on that one, but it's something that a lot of people are fascinated by. looking at the universe as a whole, cosmology, the birth, life and death of the whole universe. We used to have a nice simple model. Then we had to add things like dark energy and our nice simple pictures getting messier and messier and messier. I have this sense that we need to picture cosmology, the evolution of the universe, in a whole new way. 
I'm probably not one that can achieve this new thinking, but somebody will. And I feel at the moment we're kind of waiting for it to happen, a bit like a pregnant pause. A bit like what happens when there's a snowfall, first snowfall of the year, and everything goes quiet and kind of waits. I feel we're in that sort of phase. Nothing is static. Nothing is final. 